The next item of business is a statement by Jenny Goldruth on ScotRail, a new beginning. The Minister will take uh, questions at the end of her statement, so there should be no interventions or interruptions. And I call on the Minister for uh, around 15 minutes, please, Ms Goldruth. Presiding officer. Almost a year ago, on the 17th of March 2021, the Cabinet Secretary for Transport, Michael Matheson, advised the Parliament that at the conclusion of the current franchise, ScotRail services would be provided within the public sector by the operator of Last Resort, an arm's length company owned and controlled by the Scottish Government. The current franchising system was clearly no longer fit for purpose. Now, at that time, there was considerable uncertainty arising from the ongoing COVID pandemic and continuing delays to the publication of the UK Government's White Paper on Rail Reform. A detailed assessment of the options available for ScotRail was undertaken and it was decided that it would not be appropriate to award another franchise agreement to any party at this time. Presiding officer, today I can confirm that the transition of ScotRail into Scottish Government control will take place on 1 April 2022. And whilst that's good news, it's clear that much work still needs to be done, and in a collaborative way, to ensure the long-term sustainability of rail operations in Scotland, to best meet the needs of the people that we all represent. Now, the pandemic has changed the way that people travel. Its impact on travel patterns has been substantial. At one point, revenue in passenger services dropped to less than 10% of pre-pandemic levels. And that means that the rail industry must adapt to reflect customer need, particularly important as we strive to achieve our ambitious decarbonisation and net zero targets. And it's worth lifting our heads at this point. For countries in the EU, the largest decrease in the number of rail passengers was in Ireland, where it dropped by 74% during the pandemic, compared with the fourth quarter of 2019, or a, a fall of 9.5 million passengers. In Greece, a reduction of 68%, a fall of 3.8 million passengers, followed by Italy with a reduction of 61%, or 100, 144 million passengers. Now, in Great Britain, passenger use remains far lower than before the pandemic, with the 248 million journeys this quarter, equating to just over half of the 448 million journeys made in the, at the end of 2019 and the start of 2020. But while it's good that nearly half of rail passengers have returned to ScotRail services, travel patterns, purchasing habits and passenger demands are clearly very different than those which existed pre-pandemic. People are now much more likely to travel for leisure. The shift to hybrid working will continue to change that to some degree. And however, it's likely more people will continue working from home, at least for part of the week now and in the future. Weekends have now become the busiest times for rail travel rather than the weekday commuter periods. The travelling public are voting with their feet. We need to ensure the railways um, reflect that direction of travel. We also need to deliver rail services at times and in ways that people want to use them. Our publicly owned ScotRail will put passengers' needs and interests at the heart of all that it does. Bringing train operators into public control uh, is not new, and indeed the UK and Welsh governments have already found themselves in similar positions, with three train operating companies in England and one in Wales now under public sector control. Change is also not new in relation to rail operations in Scotland. We have seen the benefits that change can bring in the freight sector, where new ways have been found to ensure the viability of operations as freight customer demands have changed. Environmentally sustainable movements of groceries for major retailers have replaced coal travelling to power stations. And in Scotland, rail freight volumes are already returning to pre-pandemic levels. But despite these examples of positive change, it's understandable that any change can cause uncertainty and concern. That's why today I want to kickstart a national conversation about our new beginning for ScotRail and what it should look like. An affordable, sustainable, customer-focused rail passenger service in Scotland in a post-pandemic world. Just last week, I heard colleagues from opposition benches raise concerns about passenger services post the 1st of April. Concerns about timetables, ticket offices, rail fares and terms and conditions for staff. But I also heard many positive comments from members about the opportunities the transition into Scottish Government ownership presents. Presiding officer, I told Parliament last week that I would listen. And to that end, and at the core of this statement to Parliament today, is an invitation to all members who have a genuine interest in the future of ScotRail to get involved and to work with me to shape the change that needs to happen. I'm happy to meet with representatives of all parties, and my private office has already extended an invitation to opposition spokespeople on this. 
Change will happen on April the 1st. So my invitation to all members today is let's have that conversation about the change. Let's work together to influence how it happens. After all, we all want a railway that delivers for our constituents. As I mentioned last week, our rail staff have a vital role to play in shaping and delivering a successful future railway for Scotland. And like so many of our essential workers, ScotRail staff and indeed all of our rail workers went above and beyond throughout the pandemic. We will always be grateful to them for all that they did to help keep our rail services running during these challenging last two years. So I want to make clear today that we want to take ScotRail staff with us on this journey into Scottish Government ownership. That's why this invitation is also extended to the rail unions. As members made a call from last week, I will be meeting with the trade unions tomorrow afternoon. And we know the unions are passionate about the industry, as is evident from their report, A Vision for Scotland's Railway. Through open and frank discussion, we can work together to harness their aspirations for the future. And I look forward to those conversations tomorrow afternoon. Now, there was much discussion about the vision for Scotland's railways uh, in last, last week in the Chamber. And, and let me be absolutely clear. Our vision for rail is a thriving industry, one which meets the needs of passengers and is sustainable in the long-term future. To meet our climate change targets and our aim of reducing car kilometres by 20% by 2030, we need Scotland's railways. An efficient, effective, productive and profitable railway is critical to our mission zero ambition for transport. We want ScotRail to deliver the rail services the people of Scotland and the generations yet to come need and deserve. There is no doubt that the immediate future for rail services is challenging. That means we need to do all we can in the short and medium term to encourage more people to travel by rail, whilst also delivering rail services more efficiently. Throughout the pandemic, to ensure the sustainability of Scotland's rail services, to give security of employment for rail staff and to cover necessary operating costs, we provided in the region of a billion pounds of support, including over 550 million pounds of additional funding for the ScotRail and Caledonian sleeper franchises via the emergency measures agreements. But we also have to be pragmatic. This level of funding is not sustainable in the longer term, and nor is it desirable. Success for Scotland's rail services in the future includes ensuring they deliver public value and generate increased revenue. This government is also investing significantly in decarbonising our rail services. In the last 10 years, we've invested around a billion pounds in some 441 kilometres of track electrification and associated infrastructure, directly benefiting more than 35, passenger 35 million rather, passenger journeys across Scotland each year. Prior to the outset of the pandemic, more than 75% of passenger journeys on ScotRail were being made in net zero emission trains. Through our investment in decarbonisation, we want to exceed that. A successful demand-focused railway has a huge part to play in delivering a truly integrated, decarbonised transport system for Scotland. But to be truly integrated, rail needs to play a much bigger part in the overall transport system than it does at present. This is the future that we want the new ScotRail to help deliver. We also want to be an exemplar public sector company. Its culture will be founded on fair work and it will be expected to embed not just the fair work framework into its policies, processes and practices, but also fair work first. The new company will, like most other public sector arm's length operations, benefit from the public sector pay policy. Now, there has been much discussion around no compulsory redundancies as part of the engagement with trade unions in advance of staff transferring on April the 1st. And I do recognise, as I said last week, that a new body like ScotRail Trains Limited will not have an existing agreement on no compulsory redundancies in place. But I will expect there to be negotiations on this as part of the public sector pay policy discussions, discussions which are absolutely crucial to the change that is needed. Presiding officer, the new beginning for ScotRail will be built on strong foundations. This government has invested record levels to improve connectivity and increase the number of trains across Scotland's network. Since 2009, we've reconnected 14 communities to the rail network through reversal of the beach and cuts. And in the next three years, Reston, East Linton, Dalcross, Cameron Bridge and Leaven will follow. As part of SDPR2, further strategic projects are also planned in the next 20 years, including the electrification of the Glasgow Central to Barhead and East Kilbride routes being the most advanced and with the borders in Fife being developed as priority. And electrification will also encourage more freight off the roads and onto rail. All of our investment in passenger services seeks to encourage more people to choose to travel by train and to enjoy doing so. 
To do so, though, people need to feel safe to return to public transport. And let's be very clear that some of these issues do not relate to the COVID pandemic. Because, presiding officer, it's important that everyone, both passengers and workers, feel safe when in our stations and travelling on our railways. That is why I fully understand the concerns that have been raised around the ticket office consultation, for example. But safety is not just about what happens on our uh, station platforms. Passengers should be able to make end-to-end -end journeys without being fearful, without the threat of intimidation and verbal and physical abuse or violence. Antisocial behaviour on any part of our rail infrastructure, but particularly on trains and in stations, is unacceptable. And for some years now, the government has worked with our policing and industry partners to reduce such behaviour and crime on Scotland's railways. This has included addressing alcohol-related incidents, not only with a greater officer presence in hotspots and at key times, but also with direct measures to reduce alcohol consumptions, uh, consumption on trains. And we have supplemented the previous ban on alcohol consumption on trains at night with a blanket ban during the pandemic. And that ban is one that is currently kept under review. ScotRail and British Transport Police meet regularly to discuss the impacts of antisocial behaviour and abuse against passengers and staff. And whilst British Transport Police officers can't travel on all services, they do target potentially problematic services as part of their regular measures to drive down crime on our railways. Presiding officer, I met with ScotRail only yesterday afternoon and I heard more about the Travel Safe Team, which launched in October of last year. The team members were recruited from across ScotRail and bring with them a wealth of experience working from frontline uh, customer-facing roles in our stations and on our trains. And that's the sort of public-facing initiative that we should be encouraging, because we know that when staff are deployed in teams, even just their presence can act as a deterrent, helping to keep the public safe. Presiding officer, much was said last week, as I mentioned, in relation to potential ticket office closures, but particularly on women's safety in train stations. And I want to be very clear with the Chamber today that I take the issue of women's safety on public transport extremely seriously. But it's not just about our station platforms or ticket offices. It's the walk to the station. It's the journey on the train home. It's making sure you don't catch the last train to Fife because it's full of drunk men who will squeeze in beside you, despite the fact that you're surrounded by empty seats. And so you sit quietly with your headphones in until you get up the gumption to move. And when you do move, like the woman across the aisle from you, you're shouted at for daring to escape. I'm only having a laugh as he shunts his leg against yours and he hope, you hope that he doesn't follow with his friend when you move away. So let me say to the opposition benches, but particularly to the male opposition members who last week wanted to tell me about women's safety on our trains, I know all about it. I've been there. It's a systemic problem, and it's not just about our ticket offices. It's about all the places on our public transport networks where women are scared to go because of men's behaviour. So as we look to the vision for Scotland's new railway presiding officer, we've got many choices to make, but I want our railways to be safe places for women to travel. We need to identify as a government where it is that women feel unsafe on our public transport systems and then identify how we're going to fix it. And to that end, I'm announcing today that we will be commissioning and consulting with women and women's organisations across the country to better understand their experiences of how we can improve our public transport system to make it safer and more enjoyable for them to use. And there will, of course, be wider partners involved in this. I will seek to engage, of course, with the British Transport Police, for example, who've recently launched their campaign against sexual harassment. This follows data which was commissioned by YouGov during the pandemic, which showed that over half of women in London had been subjected to unwanted sexual behaviour while travelling on public transport. Over half. But crucially, it will also include the rail unions and employees, because I know this matters to staff too. Presiding officer, Scotland's new railway might look exactly the same in a few weeks' time. The trains will still be branded with ScotRail's logo, but we need a sea change in the vision to propel us forward. It will be sustainable, efficient and responsive to the needs of the public. It will be a system which looks after our rail workers and invests in their skills and talents. Today, I set out the inclusive approach that I intend to take as Transport Minister to this end. I will work with parties across the Chamber in this endeavour because getting public ownership of our trains right is so important to the people of this country. Encouraging the people of Scotland to choose to travel locally and further afield by train for work, training, education, leisure and social activities is absolutely vital to Scotland's future. They will help transform our economy, deliver on our net zero ambitions and create a fairer, greener Scotland for all. This is our vision for rail, a vision which I hope members across the chamber will want to play their part in shaping through our national conversation. Presiding officer.
Thank you very much indeed, uh, Minister. The Minister will now take questions on the issues raised in her statement. I intend to allow uh, 30 minutes or so, um, after which we will need to move to the next item of business. I would be grateful uh, to members who wish to ask a question who have not already done so to press the request to speak buttons now or as soon as possible, or press an R in the chat function. And I call firstly Graeme Simpson. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. And can I thank the Minister for advance sight of her statement? Uh, and I note the uh, generous tone that she delivered uh, it in. Um, now, the statement's described as a new beginning for ScotRail. Um, the only thing that's new is that it comes under new ownership. There has never been a vision in the year since Michael Matheson announced this. Um, that's not Jenny Guru's fault. She's new to the job, but it sounds like she wants us to help her create that vision. And in the spirit in which she delivered her statement, I am more than happy to help her with that and join her in genuine cross-party talks. But if I could gently suggest that needs to be more than the occasional half an hour. These need to be regular discussions if we're going to get this right. Because I agree with her, uh, we all want the same thing, uh, so we do need to join up across this chamber. Now, she made the mistake, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, of mentioning um, East Kilbride. Um, and if I could uh, say to her that if she wants to have a look at the plans for the East Kilbride line, she will discover that, yes, it's going to be electrified, but the plans to dual that line for its entire length were scrapped. Her predecessor offered cross-party talks to discuss this further, uh, so she may want to take that forward. Now, in the time I've got left, um, can I just ask the Minister what her view is on fares? Because any vision, to me, if we want to get people back on trains, needs to include lower fares. What's her view on that? What is her view on having no compulsory redundancies? Does she think that's a good thing or not? And does she want to get train services back to pre-pandemic levels, or does she not? Thank you. Minister. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. So, Mr Simpson covers a, a number of points in his question, so I'll, I'll try and turn to them uh, in turn. First of all, I very much welcome his uh, reception to my offer to, to parties, uh, and particularly his own, uh, uh, on the specifics he raises about the regularity of meetings. I'm more than happy to commit to that. I do very much see the vision for us moving forward into public ownership as part of the whole Parliament's responsibility. Now, it is my responsibility as Transport Minister, but I want other parties to play a part in this process and to feel that they've had an opportunity to contribute and critique, of course, at time, because that is your role. On the specific question around about the East Kilbride line, I appreciate my predecessor gave him uh, an assurance around about this point. I'd be more than happy to um, meet with uh, Mr Simpson and, and others on the specifics regarding the duelling. I'm not cited, I have to say, on the detail of that decision. Um, he will appreciate I'm more than happy to sit down with him on it. With regard to um, the fares and recent fare increases, I think he raises um, a challenging point to government around about the sustainability of public transport and our, our fares increase, as he knows, um, has still, I think, uh, fares in Scotland are still 20% lower than they are across the rest of the UK. I don't think that's an answer for us going forward, though, but it is a statement of fact. We do need to facilitate people back onto our trains. So part of that conversation is, for example, through our fair fares review, which the previous Transport Minister committed to, and I think which also gives us an opportunity to start to look at how we join up journeys across the public transport network, which don't currently happen. He asked a question around about no compulsory redundancies. He will appreciate that I am meeting with the unions tomorrow on this very, very matter. I don't want to prejudge the outcome of that meeting, but um, I can't imagine that it would be something this government would ever seek to take forward, bringing a, a company into public ownership. Um, and I did give a, a kind of seed on that in last week's debate, and I hope that gives them some reassurance. But I do want to speak to the unions about this. There are a number of other issues here that we'll need to unpack in the course of that meeting, and I'm happy to discuss this in further detail with Mr Simpson um, when we meet on the, the specifics he raised around about East Kilbride. He asks about a return to pre-pandemic levels. I would love to wave a wand and get rid of the pandemic, of course, but I got the train from Mark Hinch to Edinburgh this morning at eight o'clock and it wasn't even half full. When I caught that train two years ago, 
it was standing room only. So something has changed in the way in which people use public transport. They're scared to return to using public transport because of the pandemic. I hope we're now getting to a better place, and certainly the First Minister updated Parliament yesterday on that, and that gives people more confidence as we move forward. But this is something I think we need to work on as a government in terms of our messaging to encourage people back to public transport, to using it safely, and to supporting um, the public ownership of Scotland's trains back in Scotland's hands. Thank you, Minister. We've got a bit of time in hand, uh, but we'll probably need slightly uh, more succinct questions and answers going forward. Uh, Neil Bibby. Um, thank you, President Officer. I, I thank the Minister for advance sight of her statement. President Officer, if this is to be a new beginning for ScotRail, then there must be a new direction from the Government, a new ambition for the future. However, the starting point for the new ScotRail is cuts of 250 daily services, 50,000 fewer seats on trains, the biggest fare hike in a decade as we face a climate emergency. I welcome the Minister saying that she is in listening mode, but can I say to the Minister the test will be what the Minister does, not just what the Minister says. Scottish Labour is prepared to work with the Minister uh, now, before the 1st of April, uh, but we are not prepared to work with the Minister to cut people's services and cut people's jobs. Will the Minister confirm that she supports plans to cut overall services by 10 per cent on pre-pandemic levels? The Minister will be aware of Unite's Home Safe campaign and the concerns by passengers and rail unions about safety and accessibility on the railway. So can I ask the Minister, uh, has there been an equality impact assessment on ticket office closures? The Scottish Government expects ScotRail under public control to adopt a general public sector pay policy. Why is the Government insisting it will apply to this part of the public sector, but not others? And the Minister has said the new operator will be founded on fair work. So why won't uh, the Scottish Government categorically rule out compulsory redundancies? The purpose of bringing ScotRail back into public hands was to serve the travelling public better. That is why the Scottish Government's actions must match the Scottish Government's rhetoric. And regrettably, at the moment, it is not. Minister. I thank Mr Bibby for his question. So he, like Mr Simpson, touches on a, a number of points, and I appreciate time is... is we have got a bit of time in okay. hand. Yeah. Well, let me try to address some of his, his points in turn. He talks about cuts to services, but I think it is pragmatic to reflect on where we are with real user, uh, passenger user of, of the railways at this moment in time. How many folk are actually using the trains? I, I take the train very regularly, as I said in my answer to Graeme Simpson. People are not using the trains in the way that they were two years ago. So the first thing I think we need to take cognizance of is where we are in terms of usership locally of our trains. Do I want us to restore passenger services back to where they were? Well, we'd have to have a sea change in how many folk were actually using the train for us to go back to that. I guess the proposition then is that we run empty trains. I'm not sure if that's Labour's position on this. I'm keen to speak to the unions about it. We did have an announcement, Mr Bibby will appreciate, last week from ScotRail that there has been a restoration of a number of services back to, I think, uh, December levels. And he will also appreciate there were a number of challenges um, which led to the introduction of a temporary timetable from the end of last year due to Omicron and, and driver absences. Now, that will end from um, the 14th of February from next week. But I recognise there are challenges here. But I suppose it, it, it links very neatly, actually, to my response to Mr Simpson, which is actually around about customer behaviour. Folk are scared to go back to public transport because of the pandemic. Now, I think government can help with that, with some of the messaging. But if people aren't using the trains, there has to be a question around about the sustainability of running empty trains. Now, he speaks about cuts um, to jobs. I just want to put on the record, presiding officer, there is absolutely no proposal here from the Scottish Government to cut jobs. And we talked about this, I think, in response to the ticket office consultation last week. That is not part of the proposal. I just want to make that very, very clear. On uh, safety and accessibility, he asked a specific question, I think, around about an equalities impact assessment. So the ticket office consultation was carried out by Transport Focus, who are an independent watchdog, and they carried out a diversity impact assessment. And that is a live document which is pending final report. But it did look at reducing the number of ticket office closures from 13 to 3. And it also looked at passenger assist too, which is the system which can be pre-booked to help folk with travel onto the, the trains themselves. Um, he asked around about fair work practices. Again, I covered some of this in my response to Mr Simpson. I'm keen to work with the unions on this. Absolutely, we would expect there to be fair work principles and fair work first uh, instilled in the organisation. I want to speak to the railway unions to get a steer from them about where they are in this. And I don't want to prejudge the outcome of those conversations in a, a statement to Parliament today. 
Thank you. We've got around 15 members who wish to ask questions in um, around about 20 minutes uh, in which to uh, accommodate them all. So uh, I would hope you bear that in mind. Everybody participating, I call Fiona Hislop to be followed by Liam Kerr. I welcome this update and the decision to uh, take ScotRail into public ownership and control. So what difference will passengers and staff notice at the point of transfer? And how does the Scottish Government intend to ensure that this new rail company delivers on strategic priorities uh, like fair work, as we've heard, and net zero? Minister. ScotRail will come into Scottish Government control on the, the 1st of April. Um, I think it's 51 days away, actually. But at that point of transfer, we will expect services to continue as normal. And it will be for business as usual, for passengers and also for staff. But it's really important we give that reassurance and familiarity to passengers in the short term as we build back from the pandemic. Thereafter, ScotRail will bring forward initiatives in a measured manner to address the issues identified through the national conversation that I alluded to in my opening statement. Arrangements for the formal transfer of staff from Abellio ScotRail to ScotRail Trains Limited have begun. Staff will transfer with their current terms and conditions, and we also have committed to the application of the public sector pay policy to staff of ScotRail Trains from the 1st of April, with a caveat that any deals which have already been agreed for 2022-23 will be honoured those historic deals. The ScotRail Holdings is accountable, of course, to ScotRail Ministers, and it will oversee on behalf of Ministers the delivery of services by ScotRail Trains Limited. This robust holding company governance model will ensure that Scottish Government's strategic priorities, which include fair work and net zero, are delivered. Thank you. Liam Kerr to be followed by Jackie Dunbar. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Minister, what are the total projected costs of nationalising ScotRail? And when will the Minister publish both the forecast and the final account? Minister. Um, I thank Liam Kerr for his question on the finance. This has been funded from the Rail Services in Scotland allocated RDL budget. There is a, a budget provision of £2.5 million pounds in 2021-22 for this work stream. Um, we anticipate the full budget provision to be spent uh, on delivery of the work stream, and it is in line with uh, actual expenditure thus far. Thank you. Uh, Jackie Dunbar, who joins us remotely, to be followed by Colin Smith. Thank you, President and Officer. Rail, of course, is not fully devolved. Does the Minister anticipate this causing challenges for the new public sector rail service? And what more can be done to make the case for full devolution of all powers and resources for rail to Scotland? Minister. Um, I thank Ducky Dunbar for her question. I think it's hugely important that we do consider that the ScotRail Holdings approach was in line with um, where we are currently constitutionally. Um, she is absolutely right to say I would love to see the full devolution of railway powers to this Parliament to allow us to have that um, fullness of approach in terms of our nationalised um, infrastructure. Unfortunately, we're not there yet. I hope it's in the, the not too distant future. And I very much um, welcome um, Ms Dunbar's points around about how we can work with uh, the public on bringing forward a system which will work for the people of Scotland um, and the passengers, uh, their experience uh, of Scotland's railways. Keep Colin Smith to be followed by Natalie Don. Thank you, President Officer. It's a shame the Minister hadn't been in listening mode last week when she endorsed the biggest hike in, in rail fares in a decade and voted for 250 fewer train services a week. But if she really is listening, will she scrap the current flawed consultation on ticket office cuts? We don't yet know what passenger numbers are going to return to, and the information in the consultation is incorrect. For example, in Lockerbie Station in my own region, it claims that the station will not open at 7.30 just now, but open at 7 o'clock. When anybody who's used that station knows it is opened at 6.50 for years. How can you trust a consultation on future opening hours when ScotRail do not even seem to know what the current opening hours are? Minister. Uh, I thank Colin Smith for his question. I think, I think he raises a number of important points. Um, I, I think I was actually in listening mode last week to reflect, but nonetheless, will I scrap it? I can't scrap something retrospectively. The consultation closed on the 2nd of February, so it is done. But Transport Scotland, who, as I mentioned in my answer to Neil Bibby, are the independent watchdog for transport users, are collating responses and they're also going to provide their own view on the consultation process itself. I've been told that the timescales involved in that will be two weeks and it will then come to me to make a decision on it. I can't retrospectively scrap it, but what I will give him an undertaking is that I will look at the specifics of the issues that he mentions, because some of what he has highlighted in the chamber to me uh, gives me some cause for concern, so I'd be keen to understand a bit more about it. I think in terms of the rationale behind it, and we talked to some of this uh, in the chamber last week, this is about a behavioural shift from people not going into ticket offices and buying tickets in the same way that they might have done in the past. 
Now, ScotRail's response to this was to consult to look at how people are engaging with uh, buying their tickets. The last time we carried out a review into this was 1992. So I hope Colin Smith will understand the need and the rationale for the review, but on the specifics of his point about how the review was conducted and if there were potentially mistakes made, I will be looking very closely at the detail of that report when it makes its way to me in a couple of weeks' time. I'll give him a, a reassurance on that point. Thank you, Minister. Um, Natalie Dawn, who joins us remotely, to be followed by Beatrice Wishart. Excuse me, if you could just pause there, Ms Dawn. There seems to be something wrong with your audio. Maybe um, if you could begin again, and hopefully that might have resolved itself. I'm afraid not. I tell you what, I'm going to go to Beatrice Wishart next, and I'll come back to you um, afterwards, and hopefully uh, IT will have sorted out the problems. Uh, Beatrice Wishart. Fifty days before taking on the running of the railway and more than two years since the decision was taken, and only now is the government starting to think what to do with them. But I do welcome the engagement she, the Minister says will take place. Uh, the Minister wants to achieve carbon emission reduction targets, so would she support Scottish Liberal Democrats' calls to expand the current rail cars scheme that provides a third off travel to a model that can be seen in London and the South East, where more people benefit from cheaper rail travel, which would then encourage more people onto trains and off the road? Minister. Um, I thank Beatrice Wishart for her question. So, first of all, I think it's 51 days, but forgive me if I'm wrong, presiding officer. I may need to correct the, the record on, on that point. Um, she spoke to um, the, the tone of my statement today. I, I very much want to work with political parties on this, and I hope she will take up the offer of that invitation and others to engage in this work because it's really important we, we get it right. Um, on expanding, um, I think the, the real card she spoke to a specific uh, example for the Liberal Democrats. Uh, I don't know if that's uh, with reference to the under-22 scheme. I know she did a point on this last week. I'd be more than happy to look at the detail of it. Um, my view as Minister would be the costings involved in this. We would need to look at the detail of it. So I can't give her a specific answer on the point she's raised. But on the general point about facilitating people back onto trains, onto buses, using public transport. She's absolutely right. We've got a challenge on our hand in government. I'm not shying away from that. People are scared to go back to using public transport. A lot of people are still working at home or they're doing a hybrid approach to uh, employment and that has also had an impact on footfall and we need to be live to that but I think there's a, a job for government to do here to help support the public sector, the public transport rather, infrastructure that we have and I'd be more than happy to speak to Beatrice Wishart on the specifics of the, the proposal that she raises. I, I'm not cited on the detail of the financials around about it, she'll understand. Thank you. I understand we don't yet have Natalie Dawn's audio back, so I next call Stuart McMillan, who would be followed by Tess White. Thank you very much, Pring Officer. Officer. The Minister has spoken about the changes to travel patterns, and what steps will the new ScotRail Limited take to encourage more people to travel at short and long journeys by rail, whilst also ensuring that rail is affordable for people to use more frequently? Minister. Um, I thank Stuart McMillan for his question. It's absolutely uh, really important that people are encouraged to use rail and infrastructure on their doorstep. And one of the ways in which we can do that is through our conversations, for example, with local authorities. I spoke uh, in the statement today about the importance of working with partners, so British Transport Police, uh, Network Rail, for example, and local authorities in ensuring that people are encouraged to go back to using public transport. So uh, I very much welcome his question. He's correct. We have seen a reduction, I think, in terms of the longer journeys that people were taking uh, prior to the pandemic. People tended to take longer journeys and people also tended to use public transport to travel to work. That has now changed. We now see uh, the public using rail, for example, um, at the weekends and for leisure purposes. They don't tend to travel in, uh, on the train or on buses to work in the week in the same way they did before the pandemic um, arose. So therefore, I think that needs to nuance our approach um, as a government to how we encourage people back onto public transport. But we have to make sure that people feel safe to do that too. And I spoke to some of the challenges on that, which don't just relate to the pandemic. Thank you. Tess White to be followed by Mark Ruskell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I welcome the Minister's comments that the Scottish Government intends to consult with women and women's groups on public transport. But with reports of harassment on transport increasing compared to pre-pandemic -pre levels, can the Minister advise how many people have been charged and prosecuted over the past year and what immediate measures are the Scottish Government putting in place to protect women's safety on public transport. Minister. 
Um, I thank Jess White for her question. She raises some really important points. She asked a specific question around about um, numbers of, I think, convictions. I don't have that detail in front of me, but I'd be more than happy to speak to justice colleagues and, and share that information with her office. Um, on, on the immediate things that we will be doing, so as Transport Minister, I've committed today to consult with women's groups about their experiences of public transport. We know that there is an issue here. I see Jamie Green at the back of the chamber. I know he was um, referencing, uh, I think, data in the newspapers yesterday or the day before about LGBT people people's experience of public transport. Oh, sorry, I apologise that prejudged this question there. But I think it's really important we look at marginalised groups and their experiences of public transport, because if they're less likely to use public transport, we need to encourage them back on to, to using um, our, our railways and our, our buses. It's really hugely important. On the specifics, though, I'm really interested in the group that's being drawn together by British Transport Police uh, Chief Constable uh, Jill Murray. And I know that's going to have representation from other modes of transport. The intention of that working group is to identify and agree a joint strategy to tackle a wide range of antisocial behaviour issues on various Scottish transport networks. And I, I very much look forward to meeting with Chief Superintendent Jill Murray in the coming months and working closely with her on those issues of significant importance. I also mentioned, um, I'm not sure if I mentioned actually, uh, apologies, Presiding Officer, Network Rail have a similar campaign in this space. So it's about using the variety of partners we have on the railways, meeting together and agreeing what our way forward will be to protect vulnerable groups, as Tess White rightly highlighted in her question. Thank you, Minister. Um, Mark Ruskell to be followed by John Mason. Thanks. The Greens strongly agree with the Minister that a people's ScotRail must be rooted in the experiences of passengers and, of course, the dedicated women and men who work on our railways. Just last week, we saw damaging timetable changes for Perth and Fife scrapped by ScotRail after hundreds of my constituents campaigned for change. So can I ask the Minister, how can we harness the energy and enthusiasm of these passengers to help co-design services now and in the future to meet their needs and also to increase patronage? Minister. So to the specifics of, of Mark Russell's question, I mean, the, the May 2022 timetable, which initially proposed to, I think, add 100 extra services compared to in December of last year, is following feedback from ScotRail customers and businesses, now adding nearly 150 services following the consultation. And, and that consultation provided an opportunity, really, for ScotRail customers and businesses to help shape a reliable and responsive timetable. And it's the starting point for rebuilding Scotland's railway following the COVID pandemic and ensuring also that it's fit for purpose. Um, he spoke to co-design. I know that ScotRail currently have um, a, an opportunity, a stakeholder group, whereby they consult with members of the public. And I think that that stakeholder group, there is a proposal certainly at this moment in time, that that stakeholder group will also move um, on the 1st of April. And it's a hugely important forum where uh, vulnerable groups, for example, or members of the public can have their views listened to, but they can also feed back on the consultations that ScotRail have undertaken. Now, I know they used the stakeholder group, for example, when they were framing some of the design around about the ticket office consultation, but also on the timetable consultation. I hope that gives Mark Ruskell uh, a reassurance that some of these structures are already in place, and I would very much expect them to migrate over um, on April the 1st. John Mason to be followed by Natalie Don. Uh, thank you. Uh, the Minister mentioned passengers, freight, uh, the union's decarbonisation, uh, safety for passengers. Does she have one overriding aim for the railways? Minister. I'm not sure if I can pick one. Um, I thank John Mason for his question. We need an efficient, reliable, sustainable uh, railway service for all of Scotland. But I was really struck by some of the comments in the chamber last week around about what our vision is for ScotRail services. Are we just going to th keep things ticking over as usual? I think we need to have a, a rethink. And that's why I framed today's statement in that space. And what it means is that I want to work with partners and political parties in this chamber, but we also need to make sure that we have a railway service that encourages passengers back onto our trains. We need to recognise where there are challenges in that respect. And I've given the example today of women in particular, but it's not just women. There are some people who are fearful of using our trains for a variety of different reasons. Some examples were highlighted to me, I think, in the context of the ticket office consultation around about disability, for example. So we need to take cognizance of that as a government and help move forward on April the 1st. Um, I hope that gives John Mason an idea of what my vision is, but I am interested in looking uh, and speaking to other political parties on this. And of course, tomorrow's uh, meeting with the trade unions will help to give me more of a flavour of their positioning on what steps they want us to take as a government as we move forward together in partnership on April the 1st. Thank you. I'm now pleased to announce the delayed arrival of Natalie Dawn uh, to be followed by Katie Clark. Ms Dawn. Thank you, President Officer. Third time lucky. Um, 
While well, appreciating the concerns that unions may have about how the public sector pay policy could have an impact on pay increases this year, would the Minister be able to provide more information about the potential additional benefits that the public sector pay policy will have on rail workers as we bring Scotland's railway into public ownership? Minister. Public sector pay policy sets out the parameters for pay increases for staff, pay remits and senior appointments, and it applies to Scottish Government's core directorates and its associated departments. It maintains our distinctive Scottish approach to public sector pay, and it also continues our focus on sustainability, reducing inequalities and promoting wellbeing. It underlines our commitment to tackling poverty with specific measures set out to address low pay, for example, including the introduction of a Scottish public sector wage floor. The key benefits of it, uh, if I can summarise, presiding officer, are to invest in our public sector workforce, which delivers top-class, person-centric services for all, to provide a distinctive progressive pay policy, which is fair, affordable, sustainable, and delivers value for money in exchange for workforce flexibilities, and to reflect real-life circumstances, protecting those on lower incomes, continuing the journey towards pay restoration for the lowest paid, and recognising recruitment and retention concerns. Thank you. Katie Clark to be followed by Christine Graham. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I also welcome the Scottish Government's announcement that it will be consulting women on their safety on public transport. Last week, the Scottish Women's Convention and Inclusion Scotland wrote to the First Minister expressing grave concerns about the proposals to close three booking offices completely in stations and cut hours in 117 further stations. A recent survey of women transport workers found that 45% said they had prevented the sexual harassment of passengers in the last five years. Does the Minister agree that cutting staff in train stations will deter women from using the railways? And will she agree to a full debate in the Parliament on women's safety on public transport? Minister. So I thank Katie Clark very much for her question. On the, the latter part of her question, yes, I will agree to it. I think it's hugely important. I, I've set out today some of my thinking around about this challenge. And I, I felt last week the issue of women's safety on public transport was kind of tagged on to the end of a lot of other heat around some of the political debates we're having. I, I think it's too important an issue to do that. But on the specifics, she, she, wrote, she mentioned um, the, um, the cuts, for example, to staff. I just want to, again, presiding officer, put on the record there are no proposals from the Scottish Government to cut any staff numbers. I am live to some of the challenges around about the ticket office consultation here, particularly in terms of women's safety. I've mentioned some of those factors. We also need to think more broadly about women's experience of public transport. I hope she will accept that point because it's not just about our ticket offices. It's standing on platforms. It's walking to the train station. It's getting home from the train station late at night when it's dark. So there are lots of other parts of women's experiences of the public transport system that we need to identify, which don't just relate to ticket office closures. But um, I think she raises some really important points, and I'd be more than happy to have this debate on government time. I have announced today that I am uh, commissioning research onto, into women's experiences of public transport, because I think we need to get the data. I also cited some of the specifics of women's experiences of the public transport system in London, which I thought was really quite compelling, and the actions that British Transport Police are, are taking to that end. So I hope that gives her some reassurance around about the seriousness that I take uh, this this issue with, or judge it with rather, um, but on the specifics of the ticket office consultation, again, I think I answered some of that in Colin Smith's response. It will come to me in two weeks' time, and I will look at the detail of that and specifics with regard to women's safety on public transport, because it is so important, as she's highlighted. Thank you. Christine Graham, to be followed by Demi Green. Uh, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Can I refer to the shift in balance from um, commuting a business model to one of different post-COVID, a balance between commuting and tourism and leisure travel? Can I ask if the Scottish Government will give consideration to investigating providing integrated ticketing with, for example, discounted access to various tourist destinations, for example, on the Borders Railway to say the National Mining Museum, the Great Tapestry of Scotland and Abbotsford, um, uh, coordinating with the management of these, which I think might increase travel on the railway? Minister. Um, I think Christine Graham raises a number of really important um, Points. I, I think actually I was meant to, to visit the, the Great Tapestry of Scotland with her 
in my previous role. Uh, maybe we'll get there one day. I've certainly been to the National Mining Museum. I think she makes a really valid point, which is how do you join up a public transport system with tourism opportunities locally? And, and she will know my interest in this as the constituency MSP for Mid Fife and Glenrothes, where we will shortly next year have Leavens Railway coming back after 50 years. And there are really great op tourism opportunities on our doorstep in Fife that I'd be keen to explore locally. But to the specifics of our point about integrated travel, um, I think the answer is the Fair Fares Review, which was commissioned by the previous Transport Minister, will give us some of the data and the understanding of um, how we might be able to deliver that. I'd be keen to explore it further because she's absolutely right. We have moved away from a society which primarily uses public transport to commute to work to one which uses it for leisure and tourism opportunities. And therefore, we need to think as a government about how um, we integrate our public transport ticketing um, to reflect that, that modal shift. Thank you. Despite the earlier spoiler alert, I called Jamie Green to be followed by Gillian Mackay. Thank goodness, Presiding Officer. I thought the Minister was going to steal my thunder for a second there. But I do want to raise quite an important issue. There have been 676 incidents, those incidences of hate crime reported on our trains in the last five years, a third of which are directed towards the LGBT community. But it's not just them. Uh, there have been targeted incidents against race, religion and disability as well. I think we all agree that we have the right to safely use public transport irrespective. So can I ask what dialogue specifically the government will be having with all groups, including minority groups in society, to ensure that they have full access uh, to public transport uh, irrespective uh, of, of, of uh, their status? But not only just that, what action will she take to ensure that her justice partners in government are to be sure to charge and prosecute those uh, who perpetrate hate crime against those who are most marginalised and most at risk uh, of these attacks. Minister. I thank Mr Green for his question. I apologise for um, pre-empting it somewhat earlier on. Um, he raises a really important point. I've seen some of the coverage um, that he received in the, in the press on this with regard to the LGBT community and their experiences of public transport. He also raises race religion and disability. And it's absolutely right that these uh, groups who are often very vulnerable anyway feel safe on public transport. Government has a responsibility here. Um, I've spoken to my concerns around about women's experience of public transport in particular. I think it's really important we take an intersectional approach to this as a government, recognising uh, the minority groups he has spoken to. He talked to how I might engage with them. So in uh, my statement, I set out some of the plans I have around about a national conversation. So it's not just about speaking to political parties, it's our trade unions, and it would also be charities and third sector organisations, I expect, in, in this endeavour. He mentions um, about the links here, of course, the, the natural links with justice. Um, I think I'm keen to meet with justice uh, officials on this specific issue. Tess um, White asked a specific question around about crimes, for example, committed in prosecutions. The, the statistics for that would sit with justice, but I'm keen to meet uh, with Cabinet Secretary for Justice to make sure we get a joined up approach um, to how we deliver our vision for Scotland's railways, um, ensuring that we protect the most vulnerable, absolutely, as he's highlighted in his question today. Thank you. I'm conscious we're over time, but I do want to call the other two members who wish to ask a question. First, Gillian Mackay, and then Douglas Lobbyston, finally. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. I have a concern regarding staffing at stations and accessibility for disabled people. At some stations, lifts are not turned on when the station is not staffed. This will limit the ability for disabled people to turn up and travel when they want, something which many of us take for granted. Can the Minister confirm that any changes are being discussed with disabled people's organisations and that any changes will not adversely impact the accessibility of the network? Minister. I thank Gillian Mackay uh, for her question. She raises a specific point around about the accessibility of lifts and train stations. I, I will confess this has not been raised with me previously. On the specific point about uh, consultation with disability organisations, I would expect ScotRail to consult absolutely with Scot uh, disability organisations if that has not already done so. I did speak to some of the um, equality insurance uh, uh, the impact assessment rather that had been undertaken, the disability impact assessment by ScotRail in the course of the ticket office consultation. So therefore that might answer her point. But let me follow this up with ScotRail on the specific point she raises about the importance of consulting with uh, disability organisations on this, because I think it's a, a really important matter that she's raised today, specifically on accessibility and on lifts in our, our train stations. Thank you. And finally, and briefly, Douglas Lawson. Thank you, President Officer. Um, there was no rail improvements mentioned today for the North East of Scotland, no mention of Relay and the From Martin to Buchan Line, and no mention of the promised 20 minute reduction in journey times between Aberdeen and the Central Belt. Minister, have these projects hit the buffers? Minister. 
I'm, I'm sorry if uh, Douglas Lumsden missed the memo from today's statement. I'm here to work with members of the opposition. I'm not here to have an argument with you. He's raised a number of issues about services in the North East. I've set out today some of the restoration of services we've seen under ScotRail. The reason that ScotRail services, of course, had to um, be decreased was, first of all, over the Christmas period because of the Omicron variant, but secondly, because passengers are not using the trains in the same way that they were before. Now, in my response to Christine Graham, I set out the examples of tourism and leisure and why people might not be using the train. Some of the other challenges we face as a government right now is making sure people feel safe. I hope that gives them a reassurance that we are taking these issues really seriously. And I very much hope that he will join with his colleague Graham Simpson in the positive spirit of engagement and collaboration that we saw in his response at the start of today's statement. Okay, before things boil over, we'll maybe move to the next item of business. There'll be a brief pause to allow front benches to change. <laughs>